Oh boy, were we hit with the feels, truly the feels, in this latest episode of the Apothecary Diaries. I had been warned that this event was coming. I wasn't told all of the details, but I was told, get ready to see Lacan in a whole new way. And oh boy, that that's what happened. Wow, I'm still kind of reeling from what I saw this last episode. And, well, even though that be the case, let's talk about it. Hi there, everyone. Lars here from Camille's Harem. Not just a podcast by novice writers for novice writers, but also a YouTube channel by novice writers for novice writers. Because writing is an adventure, it's more fun with friends, and wow, this episode is one of those moments, it encapsulates one of those moments that you wish as an author, that you can one day pull off, and that is when you can write this one chapter, write this one scene, this moment that changes everything for the audience, where it recontextualizes everything that they've gone through, where it makes them see characters in a brand new light, where it reveals that little bit of history, that little bit of background, or that one nugget of information hidden deep within a character's head that just brings everything into the light, and just you realize just how beautiful and complex and intricate a story is. That is what so many authors aim for, and it's something that's so hard to pull off. So let's talk about what this episode did to really make that happen. We pick up immediately from where we left off in the previous episode. Mau Mau is confronting her father, Lacan, and is going to challenge him to a game of chess. However, she is, of course, adding all of her little Mau Mau-isms to this game. Not only are they going to play a full-on five sets of games and see who wins, the first person to win three games is going to be the overall winner of the match. However, she does add a few rules and some bets to it as well. The bets are are this, that if Mau Mau wins, Lacan has to go and buy out a Curzon's contract over at the Vidigris house. If Lacan wins, Mau Mau must then become officially his daughter. She does stipulate, I do have a working contract, an employer's con an employment contract over there with Jinji, but of course Lacan's like, <laughs> I love how he just suddenly becomes this sly fox. He's like, I can absolutely get around that. That's not a problem for me. But then what Mau Mau introduces are two rules that instantly set this guy up for failure. For each one of the games that they play, there is a cup to be drunk. Within three of the cups is poison. The other two, no, just some antidote or something fine to drink. Three poisons, Mau Mau swaps them all around inside of Lacan saying, well, we, you won't know which one, which ones really have the poison. Of course, Lacan being the immense, incredible strategist and tactician that he is, is like, oh, pff, child's play. I can easily figure out which cups has the poison, and I can also quickly narrow it down. This won't be a problem whatsoever. And there is another rule. If, for whatever reason, someone must forfeit a game, they instantly lose the whole match. All five games automatically. Lacan agrees to this. So, thus begin the games, and Lacan easily destroys Mau Mau in two games, and then allows her to win the third. Of course, because he begins to realize, well, Mau Mau has already drunk two glasses, it's a very good chance that she has chosen one of the poisons. He's tried to get her, he's tried to make sure that she isn't drinking any of the poison, because he doesn't want to hurt his own daughter, but... Oh, what if there's the case? What if I did miscalculate? I don't want to hurt my daughter. Fine, then I will graciously lose this game, and I will see if she has drunk a poison or not. I love the back and forth right here, and there's a good reason behind it. It's not just simply the game of wits that these two characters are playing. Instead, it is all meant to be a distraction from what is actually going down, because in an attempt to make sure that his daughter isn't drinking any poison, Lacan takes one of the cups, he drinks it after making sure they loses in one of the sets, and then... He gets conked out because this guy is an incredible lightweight. He cannot hold his sake, which immediately recontextualizes some of the things that I was thinking that he was doing because he's always going around with a drink. I thought he was drinking wine. Turns out he was just drinking juice. So I completely misread that, that situation right there. After just a sip of sake, this guy is 
out. He cannot wake up. Mau Mau tries to wake him up by shoving some water down his gullet. He is completely out. Boom, he cannot play, therefore he's forfeited. He has lost the whole thing. And now he's going to get transported over to the Vidigris house in order to choose one of the courtesans for whom he's going to buy out her contract. And I'm just going to say, before I get to the flashback, it is interesting that he is sent to Maymay's room. And I think this is really interesting right here because this, again, lends itself to how Mau Mau is able to read people. She understands a lot. There are many times where she is naive to certain things. There's things where she's just kind of stupid. It, but what I love about this is how Lakana is sent to Maymay's room indicates that, above all, Mama at least understands her sisters, the girls who helped to raise her. And she knows that Mei is someone who is looking for a man who matches her wits. She's looking for someone who can give her more than just the life in the brothel house. Mao Mao did ask her, why don't you leave and start up your own house? You have the beauty, you have the connections, you have the knowledge, you could make this happen. But Mei Mei just says, well, maybe a little bit longer. I'm still trying to figure things out. And Mao Mao understands this really isn't exactly your life. And you probably are able to find any sort of man who really satisfies you intellectually either. Fine, fine. As much as I just despise the guy, I love you. And one of the ways I can get him off my back and try to make sure that he is distracted otherwise, I am going to give you a man who you are intellectually compatible with. And so she makes sure, she makes sure that her father, Lacan, is sent to Mei Mei. Now then, that's how I read the situation based off of some of the previous conversations that these characters have had. But now that we get to the flashback that Lacan goes through as he's completely blacked out and has no idea that he's being spirited away off to the Vidigris house, we get to see this guy's childhood and early adult life. And wow, wow, so much is going on right here. Now then, people have been telling me in the comments that what Lacan had been uh, suffering under in the previous episode is that he cannot recognize faces and so everyone has a different chess or go piece which I thought was very interesting I had chalked that up to the fact that he just lived through chess he just consumed it so much and we now understand that yes that's kind of the case but it was also a coping mechanism for not being able to recognize people's faces his uncle who I think this is really interesting because there's a very good chance that said uncle is also the one who raised Mao Mao after everything that happened between Lacan and Mao Mao's mother he's the one who inspires Lacan to take his love of chess and go and utilize it as a means of understanding people and putting at least names to their faces. Even if he can't understand their faces, he can put designations to them. So Lacan, with his great intellect, with his ability to use chess and go as a means of coping with life, this kid just kind of becomes a little bit of an intellectual rock star. So despite the fact that his own family life is definitely... Eesh, not enviable in any kind of way due to what was going on between his uh, father and his birth mother, Lacan has everything that he needs in order to succeed in life. Granted, he is given a post. This is not something that he ex that he exactly went for because even though he says, like, I'm a weak person, everything, he is brilliant, he's intelligent, and with the right connections through his uncle and through his father, he is given a post as a military officer within the Imperial Palace, and he quickly rises through the ranks through all of his intelligence and successes, which gives him plenty of money that this guy can now throw around. Remember, this guy is some intellectual... A superstar, basically a playboy, though he's not going around Tony Stark style, yet maybe he kind of is because he ends up at a brothel. But the reason why he comes to the Vidigris house is not to enjoy the pleasures of the night, but because there is a famous courtesan there who is brilliant at games of strategy. So he's going to test himself against her. Oh, this is going to be so much fun. And he loses spectacularly. Immediately, he becomes infatuated, and for the first time, he truly sees another human face. It is the face of Feng Shan, Mao Mao's mother, the one woman who we can say he truly has loved, the one person with whom he has had a true human connection other than his daughter Mao Mao and 
he just becomes absolutely infatuated with her. He wants to meet her, he wants to play with her, and they form a relationship through all the times that he buys out her time. However, because she's just so beautiful, she's so uh, she's so proud, she's so intelligent, this becomes alluring to a lot of men, they begin to have a bidding war, who is going to buy her first time, who could buy out her contract, and Lacan is unable to afford her other than once every three months. As the bidding war is about to come to its conclusion, and she's about to have her contract bought out, Lacan is able to meet with her one more time, and Feng Shan decides, you know what, we're going to have a bet, just like with between Lacan and Mau Mau, well, as they will have much later on, and it is, if you win, you may demand one thing from me, and if I win, I will take one thing from you. And as they are playing Go, things just happen. It's as if they both are on that same level. They both understand this is kind of the moment. Fang Shan's in love with him, Lacan's in love with her, and so they get into bed and things go on from there and that's when everything comes crashing down they had their tryst in the night could it be could it be kept a secret who knows and we'll never know exactly what would have happened because unfortunately for Lacan at the same time that this is all going down his uncle loses his position within the imperial palace if it is indeed the man who adopted Mau Mau this comes to the night that babies were swapped something has happened back at the imperial palace and this is where Jinji's story begins to get wrapped up in the overall drama and conspiracy of what is going on here in any case now, without his uncle within the Imperial Palace, Lacan falls under suspicion. What if he has been doing something to endanger the Imperial family? What if he also is somehow going to prove disserviceable to them and even ruin their reputation, ruin the lives of one of the members of the Imperial family or Imperial court? In order then to save the reputation, Lacan's father has him transferred out to a military outpost where he can prove himself worthy without the influence of his uncle. However, what he believes would be just a short six month deployment ends up being three years and during those three years well Feng Shan was pregnant gave birth to Mao Mao as such proved that she had broken her contract and as a result now she couldn't make a living for herself other than to sell herself out by night and thus contracted syphilis which led to her just becoming a poor deranged woman leading her to attacking Mau Mau and slicing off part of her finger as well as her own, sending the severed fingers to Lacan. Part of this whole curse element, which I'll admit I don't fully understand, but I guess I can understand this as a means of saying, you did this to me, you need to take responsibility for it, and if you don't, curse it be the rest of your life, Lacan. Fortunately for this guy, he is getting all of these messages three years too late, and it's too late. It's too late to save the woman that he loved, it's too late to claim the daughter that he always has wanted, and as a result, Lacan has been living a very broken life for many years now. But in a way that belies the statement that Mau Mau gave some episodes ago, that she doesn't believe that she can actually love, or that she can really understand love, we see that Mau Mau gives love in her own way. Because as Lacan wakes up in Mei Mei's room, and he doesn't see her the same way that he sees Mau Mau, or the way that he sees his true love, Feng Shan, She's still just a woman with a with a chess piece for a, for a head, but there is a relationship there. He has a good relationship with her, and they are in many ways intellectually compatible. He's given a chance. Buy out this woman right here. Save this woman from the situation that you couldn't save your true love from. Also, here's a blue rose, a blue rose that you can preserve. So what will it be, Lacan? Will you preserve the beautiful memories that, that you have by doing something right? Or will it be that you can preserve some dignity, bring it back by doing the right thing? Or is it a request to do the right thing by someone else right now? It's really hard to say. But as someone, as someone told me in the comments to my previous review and analysis, it was this that a blue rose, because it is something that just won't really exist in real life, at least not out of nature, you have to make it. A blue rose thus symbolizes 
a fantasy. A blue rose fantasizes a dream that you wish you could have. And while it might be just a fantasy that Lacan could ever be Mau Mau's real father, that doesn't mean that there isn't a fantasy that he can't hold on to still. Doesn't mean that he can't be happy even after all this time. And I believe that that's really what's happening here within that moment. As he looks in the box that Mau Mau has given to him of a dried blue rose ready to be preserved. She does get in one final dig, one final kick by preparing a really nasty drink for him to consume without knowing what he's just drunk and who knows what it is that this guy's just ingested. <laughs> but it's Mau Mau's parting gift to him. And it is, I would say, a very loving gift for a man who maybe she doesn't believe deserves it. But it's a way in which she can bury the hatchet once and for all and hopefully they can both now move on. Because as Lacan says, you can't just wind back the past. You can't change it. Truly, this was an incredibly emotional, beautiful episode. This is one where the idea of good guys and bad guys just kind of gets tossed out the window. Instead, what we're dealing with here is we're dealing with people. And I think that that right there is what the author really wanted to change. How everything comes into a brand new light. We've, we've had these conspiracies. We've had these confrontations, these challenges. Is There are indeed assassins and murderers within the Imperial Palace. And so we've been conditioned in some kind of way, even though we've seen that ultimately many times the, the rug gets pulled out from underneath us. And oh my, it's not as you thought it was. But... The world of the Apothecary Diaries is one where there are indeed heroes and villains, and where people still struggle to find a happy ending, though very few do. Princess Fuyo being one of the few ones, one of the rare ones, who actually is able to ride off into the sunset with her knight in shining armor. For most other people, they don't get that. But we are still given this dynamic of heroes and villains, of right and wrong, of freedom and conspiracies, is of autonomy and being bound to a place, to contracts, to society, to expectations. And when you have that kind of a dynamic, it's so very easy to just throw things into the black and white of right and wrong, of good and evil. But when we look at the heartbreaking story of Lacan and Feng Shan, what we see is we see people being people and that people fall in love. People make good choices. They also make bad choices. And sometimes things happen outside of your control, which leads to just total heartbreak and devastation. And yet at the same time, people can forgive. People can start anew. And while it may not be the happy ending that you wished, you can still find plenty of joy and happiness in your life, depending on the choices that you make and the opportunities presented to you from others. I believe that that is the message that this episode is trying to give. And that is the message that when you then look at the rest of the Apothecary Diaries, kind of in hindsight, you realize that while indeed they're the good and the bad people and all the other things I said, this is a story about people being people in all of their beauty and ugliness and their complexity in their joy and in their sorrow. And in the middle of all of this, you have this incredible girl, Mau Mau, who, despite being addled in the head in all different kinds of ways and loving the poisons that she does, coming from the background that she does, being unable to understand people to a certain extent, and yet having this absolutely brilliant intellect and being able to manipulate and understand people and yet not being able to read people. It's so weird. Well, that's just who she is. And that's kind of the way that the world is. And isn't that beautiful? Isn't that amazing? Now, this, of course, leads to the question that I must ask as a member of Camille's Harem, as part of a podcast and a YouTube channel for novice writers, by novice writers, what can we actually learn from this? Because this just seems like, how on earth are you supposed to pull this off as you're, if you're a novice author? Well, I'm going to tell you this. You're most likely not, at least not at first. It's going to take a lot of work. It's going to take a lot of practice. It's going to take a, getting a lot of things wrong. But the way that you can pull this off is think about the game that was being played. You were presented with one thing when really it was another. It might just seem like a straight up game, a straight up bet. We're going to have this duel of wits. And yet, what was it all about? 
it was all about getting Lacan to drink sake in order to knock him out. As an author, if you wish to pull the rug out from other people, if you wish to recontextualize what it is that they're reading and pull a neat little flip, not necessarily a plot twist, but rather give them some information that throws the rest of the story into a completely new light, the way that you do that is you basically have to play the same game, the same con that Mau Mau was. Present in great detail your entire story, but withhold the right information until the right moment where suddenly everything else becomes clear. If you present enough information, enough of the rules, enough of the characters, people will love it and enjoy it and read on and watch on and they will think that they understand everything that's going on until you reveal that one bit that puts everything into a new light. Another good example of this actually, I believe comes from the Fablehaven series, where you've got lovable stuttering Gavin, who is a great warrior for the good side and who's able to speak with dragons and befriend dragons, which is very helpful because dragons are not easy to deal with in the Fablehaven series, until it is revealed that Gavin is truly an imposter and that everything that he's been able to pull off all of his amazing heroic feats and being able to cow other dragons or speak with other dragons is all because he is a dragon himself and he is not a good dragon boom suddenly an instant change where everything just gets where you suddenly you look back on the other books and you're like oh my gosh it all makes sense now and yeah, yeah, I know, spoilers right there for Fablehaven. Trust me, there's a lot of other really great things that I will not spoil from Fablehaven. And at least I haven't spoiled Beyonders yet. Dang it! I so need to do a series of videos about Beyonders because it's such an amazing trilogy. It's such an unsung hero and epic of modern fantasy. Uh, but all that aside, again, if you wish to pull the rug out from people in a really good way, you have to do what Mau Mau did present your story in as much detail as possible but make it misdirecting because you're not telling your audience everything until the right moment where you give them that last bit of information and you throw them for a doozy just like Lacan was but yeah so there you have it my review my analysis and some writing advice from this penultimate episode of the apothecary diaries i really have no idea what we're going to get in the next episode which is titled uh, mau mau and jinji i do believe as one person said that this season was all about introducing mau mau getting to understand who she was and understanding the world of the rear palace and the imperial palace as well as the red light district and where mau mau plays a role in all of this However, from this point on, as we've already seen, her story is quite well intertwined with Jinji's. And now, for this boy, it's time that we begin getting to know a little bit more about him. I think that this episode, this last episode that we'll get, will be the conclusion, ultimately, to where Mau Mau needs to be. What has her adventure been? She will hopefully get that realization of, this is who I am as an individual, and this is why and where I belong, where I am. And now, with all that being wrapped up, Let's have a little bit of a cliffhanger to tell us that we're going to focus on Jinji next. That would be my guess. We're just going to have to see next week. But in the meantime, I would love to hear about your thoughts, your analyses for this episode. What kinds of things really impressed you? What kinds of advice would you walk away from if you are an author? I'd love to hear it all in the comments. But otherwise, thank you guys so much for joining us on this incredible adventure that we call writing. And until the next video, y'all, tschüss.